All right. So now I'm going to give you a lecture that I gave uh, at the Department of Energy combustion meeting just a few weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's showing what my group has done. So the things I've talked about so far is like trying to represent the whole community of what we're doing. But now I'm just going to show you what my group has done. But it's also showing sort of the potential of what, what can be done in the future, I think. Um, and this is all in the philosophy of the predictive mode. So we're just trying to predict things, and then we compare the experiment, and we see that we're wrong, and we're interested in how wrong we are. And we're not really, I'm not into the how to adjust things to make it fit better part. I haven't tried to do that at all. Um, all right, so we want to have predictive fuel models uh, because the fuels are starting to change, and we need to be able to predict what the new fuels will be like and which ones are good ideas to make. Um, and I guess something I haven't talked about before is that there's a, a new field called synthetic biology, and it's a way to genetically engineer the microorganisms, and you can make them make all kinds of molecules for you. And so if you knew that some uh, molecule would be a great fuel, it's actually possible to make it pure, actually, as a, with a bacteria by genetically engineering it. And so uh, at MIT, there's like 15 faculty. That's all they do is they just try to genetically engineer uh, microorganisms to make all kinds of, uh, of molecules. They're mostly using them to make chemicals right now um, to compete with the regular synthetic chemistry stuff uh, for ones that are hard to make um, with organic chemistry. They make them instead with the, with the bio, have the bacteria make it for them. Um, but they're interested to try to do this for the biofuels as well. So maybe find bac um, bacteria or yeast that eat um, cellulose and then uh, convert it into the biofuels for you, for example. And so they, they came to me, actually, there's the beginning of this whole project, the this whole center was my, my colleague who sits next door came to me and said, hey, um, I have 15 different molecules here that I can make my bacteria make. Uh, which of them is a good biofuel? And so they drew the structures of the 15 molecules. And I was like, I don't know. I felt kind of embarrassed because I'm, I'm the combustion expert. And, the, and I didn't even know which is a good one to make. Um, so then I thought I really better figure this out. And, um, and it's, they need to know because it's a lot of work to go from, they have a, a, you know, one bacteria strain, and they measure that it makes a certain nanograms of this fuel molecule. And if they want to scale it up and optimize it to make it really for manufacturing the fuel, it's like a lot of work. It's like many years of work to try to refine the strain and work out the whole conditions of how to run the reactors and everything. So they don't want to put that effort in. If it turns out that they're making something that's a crummy fuel, that wouldn't be a very smart idea. So um, they, they were very interested in that. Um, so the problem is there's a lot of potential fuels that you, we might want to evaluate. And then actually, there's many different times of engines, too. And by the time any of these future fuels actually makes it in the market, probably the engines are not going, not going to be the same as the engines are today. So you have this kind of weird situation where you want to be able to predict the future, predict what fuel would be used in what engine, and then assess, is that future a good future? Is it any better than what we got now? Um, in order to see if this is a good idea or not. Um, so the idea um, that my group has been working on for a long time, and I've been working on too, is um, to try to have a, a designer, like an engine designer or a fuel designer, sit down and type in the parameters for their engine, their combustor, and their fuel, and press go, and have the computer construct the whole model, and solve the whole model, and predict how it would behave. And that way, the human doesn't have to get too involved in it. And for this to really be practical in industry, it should be that this guy comes in in the morning, he types this in, he goes away, gets a coffee break, comes back and looks and sees it's still working OK, goes away again, comes back after lunch, and on his computer should tell him, Oh, this combination has efficiency of 23.7%, and it makes emissions or whatever. And then he can assess, is this really better than what I, my other alternatives are or not? If it doesn't get to this point, it's not, we haven't solved the problem. Because in reality, most of the hard work of designing new fuels and new engines is going to be done by people who are like bachelor's level mechanical engineers or chemical engineers. They're not going to build 7,000 reaction mechanisms with 400 species and calculate all these rate coefficients and come to this course and learn how to do the pressure dependence. And it's just not realistic. Um, it's got to be automated. It's got to be good. It's got to be product, you know, production quality. Um, and so that's where we have to get to. And so that's what we're trying to do. 
Um, and uh, back in the back of this program is the databases. We have databases of experimental, experimentally determined rate coefficients, and we also have a whole lot of rate and thermal estimation procedures. Some of them are group contribution methods, and some of them are quantum chemistry. Um, now, the fuel chemistry models, is, as we've noted a few times, are really huge because it's a long way from a complicated fuel all the way down to CO2. There's a lot of little micro steps of the chemistry. Um, and there's a lot of competing pathways. Um, and some of the competing pathways go off to make toxic emissions and soot and all kinds of things we don't want to make. Um, also, the whole thing is really nonlinear, which makes it really fun and interesting to solve, to study as a research student, but really a pain in the butt if you're trying to actually make a device that works. And, um, and the real fuels uh, have a huge number of species in them. So even gasoline uh, the, has at least 100 different chemical species in it as it comes out of the pump. Once it starts to react, it has maybe 10,000 species inside of gasoline. And then if you take uh, jet or diesel, it's much more, much more complicated. Um, now, currently, people build models by hand, like people like Coron. Um, build models by hand, and so they'll build models typically about 1,000 species, about 5,000 reactions before they get tired. And they'll say they're done, right? And, um, and they try to use intelligence. So the human is spending the time thinking about which reactions to write down. They try to write down the ones that they think are going to be important, and they try to sort of pre-screen and leave out ones they think are really going to be negligible. Um, my group has been developing trying to get the computer to do it. Typically, we find out that the computer makes models that have about 500 species and maybe 10,000 reactions. And the computer's really not doing this pre-screening on the reaction. So it's being more comprehensive to get all the reactions among all the species. But because of that, it has trouble to do too many species. Because once you have a lot of species, you get, if you're comprehensive, you get a lot of reactions. And sometimes that can even overwhelm the memory of your computer, just keeping track of all the reactions. Um, and typically, to construct that model of 500 species and about 10,000 reactions, the, the software typically considers about 30,000 species. So it, it considers 30,000 potential species that could be in the model and finds, say, the 500 that are most important or numerically significant and puts those in. And then uh, and typically considers over 100,000 reactions and finds that most of these guys are negligible and maybe 10,000 of them are fast enough to be important at your conditions. Um, so anyway, so we, we want a black box to do this because we're, we're going to do something with 10,000 reactions. Obviously, you don't want to do it by hand. Um, and so we want the inputs to be some design elements that are going to tell us the reaction conditions, um, a database of the chemistry knowledge, uh, hopefully clearly documented so everybody knows exactly where our numbers came from, and people can help us to correct the numbers if we had bad estimates of things. Uh, we have to know the fuel composition at the inlet and uh, how it's operated, like the time scales. And then the output, we can predict the emissions, the energy performance, and ideally give error bars on the predictions. So Chemkin, which I, I assume most of you guys have used. Uh, anyway, Chemkin or, and Kentera is another one. The way they work is you type in all the reactions array parameters, or probably what you do is you download it from the Lawrence Livermore website, uh, the mechanism with all the parameters. And then the Chemkin uh, interpreter will read that and from those list of chemical reactions, convert it into the simulation equations um, with lots of conservation equations for all the species, dy, dt. Um, and then it sends that to a uh, typically differential equation solver for your reactor type you have. So typically this might be DAS, DASPAC um, or VODE, and then uh, gives the predictions. So that's, that's the current situation. And the problem with this is that this initial input list is really long. And then you can only do it if somebody's already made the list for you because the list is so long, you don't want to do it yourself. So my group's trying to make that easier by making the, the RMG software that goes from this database of documented assumptions about how things react and how you can estimate thermochemistry, and then automatically assembles this risk list of reactions for you that is a good list for the particular conditions that you care about. Um, and so that's, that's what we've been working on to try to make this RMG thing. Um, so let's talk about the challenges. I think we mentioned this already today. We have a, a, how can we identify all the important reactions to species but not include too many unimportant? That's one big issue. How are we going to estimate all these reaction rate coefficients and all the thermochemistry? to sufficient accuracy, and what is exactly is sufficient accuracy. Um, 
And uh, so we mostly do it from functional group extrapolations uh, and quantum chemistry. And uh, the large models are just to cause all kinds of problems, numerical problems, computer problems, and human understanding problems. If you have a bug in a, in a system that has four equations, you can probably find the mistake. If you have a bug in a system that has 10,000 equations, then it's a, little, it's a little more difficult to figure out what went wrong. Um, and so to try to help with this, we try to automate everything. Um, so everything is done very systematically and as much as possible done by the computer to try to minimize the chances for humans to get headaches from trying to stare at these gigantic outputs of you know, crash jobs and stuff and try to figure out what happened. Um, and there's a big, long effort in this predictive chemistry idea for a long time. So there's a whole volume of comprehensive chemical kinetics from 1997 all about trying to, to predict the kinetics, understand kinetics, and this volume of advances in chemical engineering also all about the same topic. And actually, there's a new book um, called Cleaner Combustion, edited by Bettine Leclerc, that has a whole discussion. A whole, the whole book is about how do you build mechanisms for combustion. So you, might, you might just want to look at that one. What's the name of the book? I think it's called Cleaner Combustion. And the author, the, edit, the lead editor's name is Bettine Leclerc, uh, B-A-T-T. -T. Right. She's, uh, she's the head of the combustion modeling group, actually combustion group entirely, at, um, at Nancy in France. All right, so this is how the RMG selects which species and reactions to include. So we start out with some seed mechanism that has some reactions in it and has some species that we know are important. And then the computer estimates the rates the K of TP for all the reactions connecting all these guys to each other inside our little mechanism that we gave to start with. Estimates all the thermochemistry to get the KCs, uses that to get the reverse rate coefficients. So it builds a whole kinetic model for this system. Then it goes on and says, how can these guys react with each other to make stuff that's not inside here? So you know, this guy can actually react to make propene plus H atoms. It's one of the possible reactions of an isopropyl radical. But those, those guys are not involved here, so they'll, they'll just write down Propene is a possible product from this. And it'll estimate that rate coefficient as well. And here's another one. It estimates this rate coefficient as well. And then the computer solves the differential equations inside the colored area to get the fluxes, the rates of formation of all these guys and what their concentrations are. And then from those, it can say from the concentration of the isopropyl radical that's computed, it can predict the rate of formation of the propene. And if the rate of formation of the propene ever gets to be significant relative to these internal rates, then we'll say, wow, this must be an important reaction. We better put propene into the model. So now we put, and that's what we do next. So we put propene into the model, and we repeat the entire procedure. And now we involve propene, and we solve the whole thing. And now we find that propene can form allyl radical and still have that HCCO can form HCO. And now we numerically evaluate these guys. And depending on your error tolerance, this might be significant or not significant compared to these other rates. And so if it's still significant, you put it inside and repeat. And it keeps going until there's no reaction that crosses the boundary that's numerically significant compared to the rates inside the model. Um, so that's, that's the algorithm. This is called the rate-based uh, selection algorithm. There's quite a few different ways that people do select what species to put into a model. Um, and this one uh, has the advantage that it, it's biased towards including reactions that are fast that are important, that have high fluxes. Um, so that's what you want. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that if your rate estimate is bad, if it has a bad estimate of the K, then it may make a bad choice. So if I, by mistake, if I had made a mistake in estimating this guy and I estimate to be slow, then it would never put propene in. And propene would never appear in the model if it was estimated to be too slow. So, Bugs in the thermo or in the rate coefficients propagate through to bugs in the structure of the network. And this can make it actually harder to debug what happened. Um, but if everything's working correctly and you have good rate estimates and thermochemistry estimates, this is a very efficient way to make a model that's only including important stuff and not, importing, not including unimportant stuff. Whereas most of the other algorithms that people use to, to build the mechanisms are, include a lot of unimportant stuff. And then they, they end up having to cut off the model construction at some point kind of arbitrarily just because they run on computer memory to keep track of all the species. 
So this, this one is a little, can, can be better if the estimates are good. Um, yeah, so the, the, the predictions re rely very strongly on the, uh, the quantum chemistry for the thermo and the rates. Um, we do the functional group approximation a lot. We do a lot of calculations at this level of theory. Recently, we do a lot with the F12 methods. Um, and we do primarily the very common approximations, um, which are not that accurate, but they're fast. And, and then we do a lot of work on trying to test whether the numbers that we compute are accurate enough or not. And that's kind of a very important part of ongoing effort. And this is not just effort in my group, but this is like across the community. So there's many research groups who are trying to calculate the rate coefficients in the thermochemistry better, trying to make better electronic structure methods, trying to invent new methods to compute the, the partition functions better, the tunneling better, all the, the barrier heights more accurately, all these things. Um, and uh, to a large extent, whether, uh, whether the quantum chemistry can really solve the problem for us depends on how accurately we can do this. And I'd say that the recent progress suggests that it can do it, but uh, it's definitely not all the way there yet. And so there's a lot of work needed to really push it. It's like, it's like tantalizingly close. You're being accurate enough that you start feeling like, oh, this is really good. But then you go and you try to predict you know, how it's going to work in an engine, and it's still not right. You're like, oh, dang. Got to get a little more accurate. <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's the situation. Um, now, the way we can test whether it's accurate enough is by comparing to experiment. And uh, the center that, that's running the summer school, the CEFRC, was really nice because it involved a huge number of experimental groups um, that had all different types of experimental apparatus. So shock tubes and pyrolysis, flow reactors for pyrolysis, flow reactors, partial oxidation, rapid compression machines, molecular beam mass spec, flame speed measurements, shock tubes, all these different equipments uh, to measure many, uh, many different combustion properties. And we all decided to work together. Um, and we also actually got other people who were not funded by the center also to help out. So the University of Ghent in Belgium has a really nice flow reactor for pyrolysis. They did, made a bunch of measurements for us. Um, NIST has uh, single pulse shock tubes. They made a bunch of measurements for us. And um, uh, so we have experimental data for uh, many, many different types of conditions that are relevant to combustion. And so this is really nice as sort of semi-comprehensively testing the kinetic model to see if you can predict everything everywhere. And we all decided to work together on the butanols to start with um, because we had to pick you know, some molecule because each of these experiments was like a you know, one-year campaign of experimental work to try to make the measurements. Um, so we all started at the beginning. We just said, OK, let's all work in butanols. And we started building models from butanols. At the same time, we started measuring all the properties of butanols. Um, and so the butanol is interesting. It has four isomers. Um, and they have really different octane numbers. So n-butanol is a pretty low octane fuel, lower than regular gasoline. Um, whereas terp-butanol is really pretty good. It's uh, like an octane enhancer. In fact, it was used that way commercially sometimes. Um, and so we asked RMG to make a model for all four of these guys. And it ended up making a model of 372 chemical species, 8,723 reactions. And then we uh, did sensitivity analysis, the first order sensitivity analysis I showed you there. And all the reactions that were really important, we went back and recomputed them individually with quantum chemistry to get the best numbers we could. And a paper about this is a combustion flame about one year ago by my student, Shamel. Um, so the model, uh, we started with pyrolysis. In pyrolysis, the model predicts the yields of the butenes pretty well. So these are the predicted butene yields by the model in the Ghent reactor, which has a temperature of 1,000 Kelvin, a time scale of seconds. And these are the experimental measurements in that reactor. And you can see it's, um, these are several different isomeric butanols making several different isomeric butenes. And uh, it's pretty good. Um, the model also can predict the formation of weirdo molecules from pyrolysis. So uh, instead of, in addition to the butene, which we can predict well, the pyrolysis creates benzene, toluene, cyclopentadiene. And uh, all these guys are predicted pretty accurately by the model, not perfectly. Um, and uh, you see really strange things like this intermediate is actually very important to be going from isobutenol 
up to cyclopentadiene. So this is like not obvious to me that that would be an important sequence, but it turns out that that's, that is. So this is where having the computer do it comprehensively is advantageous, because if a human was doing it, they probably wouldn't bother to write this reaction in, because they would just pre-screen and say, ah, it's not gonna matter. Um, but in this case, the computer numerically computed it and found out this is fast enough that it matters. Um, so we would typically find something like a dozen rate coefficients are very sensitive to whatever, whatever we were trying to predict at the time. And so we would go back and compute those dozen and put them in. And sometimes when we did that, the predictions would change a ton. And, and now you would either, usually you predict it better, sometimes you predict it worse. Um, sometimes when you did that, it didn't really change it. Um, uh, and sometimes, a lot of times we did it, we were happy, we got good results like this where the predictions were pretty close to the experiment. Some things I'll show you later, never, we never predicted correctly. And so we don't know why. So we don't know if we're missing the, a species or reaction, if we have a bad number for something and our sensitivity analysis is not revealing it because we're so far off. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so, and so we don't, we don't know what the reason is, or is there an experimental problem? In some of them, we had people repeat the experiments and we verified it was not an experimental problem. Other cases, actually, we identified experiments that were incorrect, so they repeat the experiment, they found that the new result matched the model and didn't, you know, it, it over, overruled the earlier one. But sometimes they repeated it and they got the same result, so obviously the model screwed up. Um, and, and then sometimes it worked out great. So I think we're like in the situation where the model, the experiments, maybe the experiments are slightly more reliable than the model, but not that much more. They both could be wrong. <laughs> the model's usually wrong. When you do the quantum calculations, it usually gets better. Uh, you know, we're sort of semi there. We're not all the way there yet. Um, uh, interesting thing, so we had this model here that was predicting everything great at 1,000 Kelvin. And so then um, the Hansen group invented a way to do the measurements in the shock tube at 1467K, so about 500 Kelvin higher. Um, and so we already had this model on our hands. So we said, okay, hey, before you do the experiment, we'll just predict what you're gonna see. And so this is what we predicted. We predicted that if you pyrolyzed the isobutanol, or this is n-butanol, uh, at 1467, you'd see some OH radicals coming up and going down, and you'd see some water coming up. And, and originally, those are the two variables, that two species that the Stanford guys were set up to measure. So we made this prediction. Then, uh, then we started doing sensitivity analysis for those observables, and we found that actually we were sensitive to a bunch of reactions that we had not refined. We were just using the estimates from the group additivity. And so we started calculating them. Actually, some of our colleagues in the CEFRC, the other quantum chemists, started calculating these particular reactions. Meanwhile, the Stanford guys did the measurement. Um, so we have this... Uh, improved prediction, this sort of, or change prediction, because we changed the rate coefficients with the quantum chemistry. And in this case, the, the experiment came in, and it was, uh, you know, we didn't predict it exactly, um, but we're a lot closer than we would have been if we hadn't done it. And so I think this emphasizes the need that if you know you're sensitive to a reaction, it definitely behooves you to get the best possible number for that reaction. And so it's always worth it. Now, it may not always solve all your problems, uh, but if you know you're sensitive to it, it's stupid to use a dumb number. So, so that's our, our general procedure is always refine all the sensitive numbers. And we don't really think we have a, a prediction until we've done that. And, if, and we're typically refining them by the quantum calculations. We, don't, we usually don't have the data at the time, so we're not trying to refine it to make it match. We're just refining it just using a better estimate, better way of calculating the number. Um, this whole got into a, uh, it, was, it was a big controversy and discussion in literature about some of the reactions involved in this. And so uh, Rosada Reyes uh, at NIST also decided to measure under different conditions. And we worked with her to make predictions for her conditions. And the model 
again, was sensitive to some slightly different reactions. And we, we used very fancy quantum methods to try to get the very best numbers to compare with for her. Um, the best experiment we found for testing the model was the synchrotron experiment at the advanced light source. And so the way this experiment works is um, you have a, f a flat flame. It's a premixed flat flame, in a, and it's a low pressure. And you stick a, a little skimmer in there, a little pinhole in the end. And some of the molecules from here go in that little hole and go through. And they come out into this region where they uh, get blasted by the um, vacuum ultraviolet light from the synchrotron. And that ionizes them. And then the ions go into the mass spec. And we measure them. And this experiment was done by Nils Hansen. And the, in this, you can, you can separate the different masses with the mass spec, and you also can vary the photon energy of the synchrotron so you can change the ionization energy. And so that helps you to separate species, because many species, isomers have different ionization potentials, so you can tell them apart that way. Um, and before I talk about this, this is a question I got yesterday, I guess, um, about the Difference, when do you expect things to be pressure independent and when do you expect them to be pressure dependent for rate coefficients? And so normal chemistry around you know, one atmosphere, 10 atmospheres with molecules that are um, heavier, you know, maybe seven carbons, six carbons. Normal chemistry, almost everything is pressure independent. Temperature, you know, 800 Kelvin or less. Um, but once you get up into combustion flat flame chemistry, you're at lower pressures and you're at higher temperatures. And almost everything is pressure dependent. So every reaction that goes through a unimolecular adduct or involves a single molecule falling apart, all of those reactions are significantly pressure dependent um, for anything with more than maybe 12, anything less than 12 carbons. Uh, so that, that was, uh, that's interesting. So we had to compute um, the pressure dependent rate coefficients. So we ended up with 5,398 pressure-dependent rate coefficients, and then about, well, we have about 2,000 other ones that were not pressure-dependent for this, to see about this experiment. So we had to, we, were, we invented an automatic way to automatically calculate the pressure dependence, identify all the wells, all the chemically activated channels, the well-skipping reactions, all this stuff. So we have that. It's, um, it makes a whole bunch of approximations to make it fast. And so it's not super accurate, but it, at least it gets a rate coefficient for it. Most of the kinetic models in the literature um, only have pressure dependence for a few small molecule reactions where it was carefully characterized experimentally. And then all the rest of them are assumed to be just Arrhenius forms. And so they would completely miss this kind of stuff. So for example, a very important uh, reaction is you make the enols from the butanols uh, pretty readily. And then the enols can isomerize to make the aldehydes. And the enol chemistry and the aldehyde chemistry is pretty much different. So it's quite important to know uh, which one you got. And the way it isomerizes most in these flat flames is you have a lot of H atoms. The H atoms add. They make some of these radicals. And then these guys have ways that they can spit out an H atom to go to this form instead. And this is downhill. But the whole thing is chemically activated. So you skip across the top of all these barriers. See all the barriers here? You skip across the top and get right to these products over there. And so this um, just illustrates the, the complexity of this is that if you started thinking about this to begin with, you say, this guy, this H atom can add. It can add here or here. Should be two reactions, two saddle points. That should be it. So I only have to calculate two rate coefficients. So in the high pressure limit, I only have to calculate two. But in this case, instead of just the two possible products, actually there's 10 possible products are formed because there are all these different isomers and all these different products over here. And instead of just two transition states, two saddle points to consider, I have to consider 16 saddle points. So this is a pain in the butt, actually. Um, and when I first started uh, 15 years ago, I would have a postdoc spend a whole year to do one of these guys out. Um, but now we have an automatic code. You just press go, and it does a 1,000 of them before, before lunch. Um, so it's a lot easier. Um, so here's the predictions compared to experiments. So the, uh, this is for the end of butyl butanol flame. These are the major species predictions. You can see it's not quite exactly right. We have some trouble very close to the burner face. And part of that is that the, when the probe gets really close to the burner face, it perturbs the flame. Um, so it's not perf perfectly accurate. On the, towards the left-hand side of these plots, the measurements are not always so good. Um, 
these are uh, predictions and experimental data for ethene, ethane, acetylene compared to the experiment. And so you can see that, like, I don't know, semi-quantitative. It looks, it looks sort of like the experimental data, right? Now, the experiments have noise. You can see it's, it's jaggedy. So it's like the, these are not dead solid experiments, but they're sort of, you know, the model's overestimating this guy, but, you know, not terrible. Um, so that's sort of the level of agreement we have. Here's for the formaldehyde, ethenol, and acetaldehyde. So we can do the, the enols and aldehydes. And here's the radicals. This is methyl radical, uh, allyl radical, and ethyl, ethyl radical, I think. And you can see we can predict the radicals, too, and the experiment can measure the radicals. So this is a pretty fancy experiment it can measure. So altogether, something like 48 species are measured. We can predict them all, all of them in this level of agreement. So you can decide if you think that's good or bad, but that's, that's the level of disagreement between the models and predictions and experiments. And there's some uncertainties due to the calibrations, uncertainties in the boundary conditions, uh, in the temperature, in the flame. So uh, uh, definitely a part of this de deviation between the model and the experiment is due to the experimental issues. Um, and then, of course, some of it's due to the models. All right, so our model predicts the, the data, I would say, pretty well. Um, and and these, the, in this case, the model predictions were done before the experiments were done. So they're just very straight predictions. Um, however, ours is not the only model that predicts the, the Hansen data very well, or, or matches the Hansen data pretty well. So these models, the model by uh, Sarathi, um, this model, these two models give very similar quality predictions for the Hansen's data, but the rea which reactions are important are wildly different. So you see like here we think that uh, our model says that this reaction of isobutanol breaking apart to give CH2OH is very important, but uh, that reaction doesn't even appear over here. So Sarathi doesn't think it's important. Um, so this is a... Uh, very important thing to keep in mind is just because you get your model to match the experiment does not move your models right. More than one model can match because you have a limited amount of experimental data and you have a very complicated model with a lot of parameters. And so if you have different parameters in the model, you may, you may be multiple possible fits that could fit it. And so in our case, we're making pure prediction. We're very happy. Um, Sarathi's is kind of adjusted, but Sarathi's one is, is a pretty good model too. And that wasn't just Sarathi. Uh, Frasel Dotti from Milano also had a model that gets pretty good agreement with the Hansen data. And it's completely different than my model and completely different than Sarathi's model for uh, the rate coefficients. So this, you know, should be alarming. Uh, so how do we know if we really got it right? I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, and uh, that's, uh, yeah, we're still, that, that's the reality. Um, and what I got here? Yep, so just, just because it matches the experiment does not mean it's the truth. Um, we also can predict flame speeds, and that's a pretty important thing to predict. Um, these are experiments done at USC, and also some by CK Law here at Princeton. Um, and here are the model predictions. And you can see, you know, it, it's, the model predictions are sort of in the data points. The data points don't agree with each other with exactly. And then over here on this side, there seems to be a little bit more error than on the other side. Now, on this side, the rich side of the flame, you know, or for rich conditions, um, we find that the model is really sensitive to this reaction, HCO plus water colliding to make H plus, H plus CO plus water. Um, and this one alone is enough to cover that whole uncertainty range, so the uncertainty in this one parameter. Um, so that's a really a problem. Uh, for, for the models. Over here, there's some model problems for the experimentalists, too. So these, these deviations are bigger than they expect. You, know, you can see they're really not agreeing that well. And it turns out that there's a kind of a tricky extrapolation to zero strain from the real experimental conditions, which have strained flames. And, the, and the one of these guys is done in a, a post-flow flame and one in a spherically expanding flame, which has opposite signs of the strain between the two apparatuses. So they're both extrapolating to zero from opposite sides. And there's some issues about that. And so it makes me think that maybe the error bars on the experimental numbers might be underestimated um, 
do these issues. But that the, I think uh, just recently, I think there's a paper in Progress in Energy and Combustion Science by um, Egophopoulos and Law and a bunch of other people all about how, to, how you do flame speed measurements and how do you interpret them correctly and what the problems are and stuff like that. So if you want to read about that, you can look at that. Um, we also want to predict ignition delays. For the high temperature ignition delays, the model predictions are really good. Um, so you can see that, yeah, the kind of level of disagreement is less than a factor of two, and sometimes much better. Um, and all the trends are right, all different isomers, um, different pressures. It really looks fine. So at high temperatures, the ignition delays are really not a problem. And I think this is a kind of a solved problem. People know how to do this now. Um, low temperature ignition delays is a different story. So some low temperature ignition delays are pretty, pretty well. So these are from rapid compression machine measurements at University of Connecticut. And these are the model predictions. And so, you know, the model, the experimentally, you know, these points differ from each other by quite a lot between the two different um, air to fuel ratios. Um, uh, and the model breaks some difference, but not quite as much of a difference. And the slope is also different, so the, like, the effective EA is a little bit different. So it's not that great. Um, but then we found that if you do the model where you hold the fuel concentration constant and just vary the oxygen concentration by varying the O to N2 ratio, experimentally it makes a huge difference. You get like you know, almost a factor of 10 difference in the ignition delays. But uh, the model doesn't detect it at all. So the model says that it, doesn't, it really doesn't depend on the O2 to N2 ratio. So there's something seriously wrong in the models for low temperature ignition delays. So this led to a whole ton of exploration of trying to figure out why the heck is going on. Why can the model be so, so badly wrong for this one property, but it's so good for so many other things? And so we started to study what really leads to low temperature ignition delays. And um, this is the story. So you have your fuel molecule is attacked by OH. It makes a radical. It adds O2. It makes peroxy. Isomerizes to make the QOH species. It looks like this. And then this guy adds O2. It makes this guy immediately uh, uh, gives off an OH right away and makes this product, keto hydroperoxide. And then this thing accumulates. And when it gets high enough concentration, it breaks and it makes OHs and this radical. And this radical goes on to make uh, um, another ra uh, other species, which is another radical. So you end up making um, one radical in, makes one, two, three radicals out. And so that's the chain branching reaction. Now this cycle that's making the radicals is, can be diverted into other paths which destroy radicals. So you can react the OH with other things and make different products which don't make more radicals and actually convert the active OH radical into an inactive HO2 radical. Um, all these paths do that. Um, down here also you can divert the RO2 in, into uh, alkene plus HO2. And so all these red things are kind of competing with the green things. And the, that delicate balance between the two of them is controlling whether or not it's going to ignite or not. Um, and the rates of these all are sensitive to temperature, especially this last one, the breaking of the keto hydroperoxide. And so as you're running these reactions, you're releasing a little bit of heat, and that heat changes the temperature a little bit. That significantly affects the rate of this reaction compared to its accumulation. Um, and when we were working on that, we discovered that the keto hydroperoxide, which is so important, its main reaction here is to break to make the OH, um, also can do other stuff. And one really strange thing it can do is it can isomerize and make this cyclic peroxide. And then that cyclic peroxide can fall apart to non-radical products, uh, acid and aldehyde. And um, that turned out to be a really important discovery for low temperature oxidation because uh, for a long time, people saw acids and aldehydes being formed in oxidations, but didn't know where they came from. And this turns out to be the dominant reaction that makes the acids and the aldehydes in you know, like liquid phase oxidations or really low temperature JSR experiments. Um, and this reaction is catalyzed, this step is catalyzed by acid, carboxylic acid. So once you make a little bit of carboxylic acid, it's autocatalytic, it comes back and it, it isomerizes, it, it catalyzes the destruction of the keto hydroperoxide into the cyclic peroxide which surprisingly to me is lower, is lower energy than the starting material. So it's actually a more stable form. Um, 
so that was that was a pretty big deal in in the chemistry world. So it was published in the in JAX. It was like the feature article there. Um, but despite that, we still don't know why the O2 dependencies. So we're still working on on details of the of the of this sequence to try to figure out everywhere the O2 comes in and how it affects the ignition delays. So we can try to understand what happened in those RTM experiments. All right, and then we can make models. Because you have this automatic RMG, you can make models for anything you want. So this last year, we've made models for all these different molecules. Um, and, and so you can do you know, all kinds of interesting alternative fuels pretty quickly once you have a, a computer program to do it for you. Um, so I think that the conclusion of this is that we can predict a lot of just from first principles without doing any experiments. A lot of different combustion properties can be predicted pretty well, but not all of them, and not always to the accuracy you want, and also not always for all the fuels you want. So as you go to more and more complicated fuels, it's more challenging for the computer to do it. Um, we, so far, we just had hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms, and what I showed you, we just recently added nitrogen and sulfur, um, but we're, we still have to do a lot of work to make sure the parameters for those, all those reactions in thermochemistry are right. Um, and I think this is a, a nice way, if you want to kind of quickly know what would be expected to happen with your fuel under your conditions, you can just run RMG and build a model for it, and you get something that's sort of semi-close to reality to get a rough idea. Um, uh, you know, and then sometimes those predictions will already be quantitative. Sometimes they won't. If you, if you do experiments, you might discover some discrepancy. And then sometimes then we can go and investigate and figure out what happened. And occasionally that leads to something really good to uh, improve what we know about the combustion chemistry and, and to try to make the better methods. Um, and I should just acknowledge the people. So this, this work, to make that software, was funded by DOE Basic Energy Sciences for many years. Um, and most of the work I showed today was done by my student, Shamel Merchant. Um, and then the CFRC, these groups did a lot of quantum calculations and also all those experiments that I compared with. I didn't do any of the experiments I showed. Um, and then these folks also work in the RMG software. This is an open source software project. And so uh, that's really helpful to have a team of people uh, working on it. Um, and that's all I have to say. So. <laughs> Questions? Um, so it depends on it, whether we've had a similar, sorry, repeat the question. Um, how sensitive are the RMG predictions to the fuel? And my experience with this is it depends on how similar fuels are that we've done before. Once, whenever a student of mine does a fuel, they always do the quantum calculations uh, for all the relevant, um, uh, for all the relevant reactions that are sensitive. Um, and they uh, therefore improve the rate estimates for all those types of reactions and all the thermochemistry too. If you get some strange fuel that we've never done anything like it before, you might have some really bad numbers. Some will use group values that might be really terrible. Um, and the, 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 the precision of all the rate estimates and thermo estimates might be wrong and you might get some goofball things. So if you're doing like alkanes, we're great because we've done a lot of alkanes. If you're doing, um, Alcohols were great, don't love alcohols. If you're doing ethers, I don't know. Uh, if you're doing carboxylic acids, I really have no idea. So you know, I think it depends on which fuel. And then each time after we do one, we improve a lot of things. Like JP10 is this multi-cyclic uh, structure. That took us a long time. We had to do many, many quantum calculations of all the different isomers. And you know, But then after we did it, then it's good. So now if you have another multi-cyclic structure that's similar, probably will, it'll be much better now. Question, yeah. Yeah, so RMG tries to draw analogies of your of the reaction it has to estimate compared to something that it knows about before. Sometimes those analogies are very strained. 
A computer is not as good at doing analogies as humans are. So sometimes they're really stupid. And so, um, it, so it'll, but it'll use a, it will get a number, because it makes some analogy. It puts some number in. It, it, it flags it. It puts a little warning thing in the Chemkin file. And so if you're a human looking at your Chemkin file, it has all these warning flags on the right side. You should be worried. Um, and then uh, if you find out that you're sensitive to one of those reactions, then you really should be worried. And then the, typically my students would do a quantum calculation for that reaction. And then they would go back in the database and replace that analogy rule with the number that's based on the quantum calculation so that future calculations done with similar molecules would be more accurate because now they have a much closer analogy. So in our database, we have, we'll have all the data we know about. And whichever one is on top, the, no, the number one listed one, the computer takes that one as if it's the truth. And so your human can change it by just changing the order in which they're listed. Um, but this is a big problem. Uh, and sometimes the small molecule chemistry affects a lot of things, especially the high temperature ignition delays are very sensitive to the small molecule chemistry. And so. Uh, if we use, you know, there's four different H2O2 models. If we change from one to the other, it'll change the ignition delays pretty significantly. And I, don't, I really don't know which one's right. Yeah? Um, you have an input file of Chemkin. Yeah, so RMG, RMGs, you tell it what molecules you have to start with and what temperature and what pressure and what the time scale is. And RMG will build a Chemkin file for you. And then you can send it to Chemkin and, and get, see the predictions of what RMG predicts. So it'll add a zillion extra reactions and species and stuff and, and estimate all the numbers, and then you can just run it. It'll, RMG will produce everything you need to write your chemical simulation, the, the thermophiles, everything. And then if you don't like what RMG did, you can go back up in the, in the RMG has its own database that has a list of all specific reactions, the small molecule reactions, and also has group additivity contribution numbers for making all the estimates. You can change those numbers. If you don't like one of the numbers in there, you can put your own in there, or you can choose somebody else's number, whatever you want. And RMG will just use that when it makes the model the next time. Question? Uh, how to run calculations uh, for the mixture of different components on using your software? Yeah, so um, the question is, how can you make a model for a mixture, a mixture of several components? And I think you can just put any, as many components as you want into the RMG input file as your initial mechanism. And it'll start generating the mechanism from all of them. Um, if you put too many in there, I think at some point something bad will happen, like it'll overflow the memory or something. So we've done a lot of them with like ternary mixtures for f maybe four molecules, no problem. I'm pretty sure if I put a thousand molecules in there to start with, something bad will happen. So, any more? Have you found that if you, uh, you know, if you were to precede your input file with a very small fraction of uh, final products that you're looking for? Would that increase or decrease the accuracy? Of yeah. The mix? Yeah. So the, the question is if you precede it, depending on what you choose as your initial mixture, does it really affect what you get in the end? Is that? Uh, specifically, you know, if I have propane and I'm going to CO2, if I put a little bit of CO2, CO2 and yeah. HCO. Yeah. So it helps. Uh, the more, the better your initial seed mechanism is, it helps the RMG algorithm. The RMG algorithm is not that smart because it's just kind of brute force trying everything and trying to add them in. And if the initial mechanism is too um, different from what the important reactions are really, it may flail around for a long time before by accident it hits upon an important reaction and puts it in. So it may add in a whole lot of baloney stuff. A lot of reactions that are really not important because they seem, their rates seem important relative to the, to the low rates you have initially. And so it puts them all in, and eventually hits one that has a gigantic rate. And once it puts that in, then it won't add too much more, because now the whole scale of the problem has gone up. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So if you can initially put in all the important stuff, um, you really help the computer to, f to efficiently find a model that has a lot of wheat and not very much chaff. Um, 
And also, a problematic case are things like the peroxides. So the keto hydroperoxide decomposition is very slow, and so the flux is small. And if you set your tolerance is not tight enough, you may not pick it up. You may not have it decompose. And so um, if you know that it's decomposition is important, if you put in the decomposition products of the ketoperoxide in from the beginning, then it'll automatically pick it up. And then you'll always pick it up even if your tolerance was not set correctly. Okay. In the back. Alkenes? Yeah, alkenes. Yeah. Um, so the RMG algorithm, sorry, the question was, can I use my alcohol model to simulate the alkenes? So some things I can, like the pyrolysis, con pyrolysis conditions, the alcohols primarily go to the alkenes. It's on the main path. And so the formation of benzene and toluene and stuff is all through the alkenes. And so that, that one it would be very good for. But in general, RMG is not reliable to do this because RMG does not build a fully comprehensive mechanism. What RMG does is it builds a mechanism that includes all the reactions that are important at the conditions that you specified. So at the temperature, the pressure, and the initial compositions you specified, you'll get the, all the important reactions. So here I put in a lot of alcohol, and I'm running some temperature and pressure, and it might make some alkenes. But it might not track down all the pathways from the alkenes because the concentration of the alkenes might be a byproduct, it might be small. So the rates, the rates over here might be so small that I say, forget it, I don't need the alkenes chemistry. But if I started with alkenes as the major product, as the major reactant here, and started it, then, then this rate would be higher because the concentration of alkene would be higher. So then this second step would come in. It would be included in the model. So you do, RMG is really better if you put in what you really have as your real molecules and your real conditions you care about. It'll try to make a model that's really good for that condition and those, mo and those molecules. And if you want to do some different molecules, you might as well just call RMG again. And since the RMG model, you can build a model in a day or two, there's no, it's no reason why you should reuse some model that's not good for you. So this is a big change. Historically, it was hard to get models, and people just reused models over and over again because they didn't want to do the effort to make a new one um, because it was too hard. Now, now you have a computer make it for you, it's no big deal. So whatever condition you want, just make a model for your condition. Yeah, I have a question based on uh, hierarchical principles. Uh, maybe the uh, big model can do uh, those great uh, predictions. For, for the small stuff. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes this works. If you set the tolerance tight enough, like in this case, this one makes some propene. If you set the tolerance tight enough, it will also pick up the allyl, and it'll pick up the subsequent chemistry. And then this alkene part would be good, and it might be a good model for propene. But if you didn't set the tolerance tight enough, it might say that this is negligible, and it would never even find these guys. It wouldn't include them in the model. So depending on what tolerance the person used when they, set, when they built the model the first time, it might or might not work as a good model for the, for the alkenes. Yeah, sure, yeah. So uh, the question was whether RMG would make a, a, range, a model for a range of conditions. And the way you do it is, in the input deck, you can specify a bunch of temperatures and pressures and initial compositions that you want. And you might demand that the model has to satisfy all, the, has to work for all these conditions. And the ones you specify, whatever you specify, it'll make sure it builds a model that's good for all of them. Um, it's only at the exact ones you specify is a check if it's good. So. If you space your temperatures out too much, you might miss. It might not work that well in the middle because you didn't specify in the middle. But it might. It's hard to predict what will happen. So I know this sorry, is sorry. Yeah. a good question. So what kind of interface are you have? Interface? Yeah. Um, at the current time, it's a command line, very stupid uh, list of keywords. Um, well, this summer, I have a couple students working on making a graphical interface for it. based on the rate constant. Uh, let's say that you have a chain of reactions that are occurring 
you know, where you take some fuel molecule, you oxidize it slightly, break off a couple carbon, and then you go to, you know, some other product. If you have six subsequent steps, but there's not really anything else happening, does RMG have any uh, incorporated treatment for going from A to D rather than B and C along the way? No. Okay. No, so RMG right now is brute force explicit. It tries to have every elementary step in there. Um, and so it builds models that are quite large. And if you have, a, say, a CFD code or a reactor code that can't handle so many species, you'll have to do a model reduction step separately afterwards okay. to use it. Uh, and I've separately worked on model reduction, but it's not in RMG. Okay. Well, yeah. I used uh, the no uh, additional uh, model before, but I, I found that uh, it's very time consuming. I don't know why. Because mm -hmm. For, for, for solving it. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question. So, how, why does it take, sometimes some models take much longer to solve than other models do. So, one, one simple thing is just size. But in this case, I think the other models are about the same size. So, that's not the issue. I think it's stiffness. So, sometimes uh, when we build the models, we pick up some intermediate adducts that are very unstable and they fall apart in a very short time. And particularly if it was a bug or if a bad estimate of one of the rates or the thermochemistry numbers, the rate can be too fast. If the rate's too fast, it makes the stiffness worse because the time scale for that species is very short. And so we've occasionally had problems where we have, it seems very, very stiff. It's very hard to solve. And it's because, most often, because we made a mistake that one of the thermo numbers or one of the rate numbers is so bad that it makes the a rate too fast, which makes the stiffness too high. And when we go back and fix that rate number to be the realistic number, then, that, then things will be better. Um, so that's most common. I think somebody else, at the break, somebody asked a question about a similar thing. This is, this is, I think it's not just us. It's a common thing. I think the LLNL, they have a tool on their website just for this purpose to try to find mistakes, um, mistaken numbers that make the thing too stiff. So yeah, this is a general problem. If you're trying to estimate lots of thermochemistry and lots of rates, it's easy to make a mistake. <laughs> Real easy. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop now. If you want to ask more questions, come on down. And the rest of you can go since it's so late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.